Hi, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to another one-on-one -on -one talk. We have a special guest from New York City, although I will tell you that she represents an excellent school in Spain, and in particular Barcelona, ESA Business School. And uh, you are a graduate of that program, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. So welcome, Deborah Candless. Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. So for North American students who are thinking about the European option, mm -hmm. um, what does that involve? I mean, how should you be thinking about this? Like, frankly, I think graduate school in Europe would be such a wonderful opportunity, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're an American. Because let's face it, you're probably going to spend most of your career here anyway, and maybe you already did your undergrad here. Uh, what better place to go than Barcelona, which is incidentally one of the world's most beautiful cities. It's vibrant, it's dynamic, the architecture is amazing, the museums are amazing, the people are amazing, the food is great. And I'm just going to tell you that uh, for a major city in the world, incredibly reasonable as well. Mm -hmm. That's what drew you there, right? Uh, well, I'm not going to say it was the, the deciding factor, but it was a nice bonus <laughs> to be able to live in Barcelona for two right. years. And I, don't, I know you don't want applicants who only want to live in Barcelona for two years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what's the framework that someone should use seriously about deciding, do I do my MBA in Europe or do I do it domestically? I mean, I think with all decisions when it comes to business school, it's a bit about your priorities and your goals. So I know when I personally was looking at business school, I really had international diversity in the classroom it was a priority for me because I wanted to have the skill set to function better within an international workspace. So to me, having a classroom that would represent uh, people from all over the world where Americans were not going to be the dominant voice within that classroom was very important to me. And I know for a lot of people that come and look at a program like YSA, um, you don't accidentally end up in Europe. It is, there is something in you that's going to drive you to challenge yourself in a way that you wouldn't get at home. Um, you want to be in an environment where you're going to have very diverse perspectives, where people understand the world differently than you, and where you can learn from their perspectives. And I think there's sort of, I guess, for Americans, there's the people that want to have that skill set, want to have that international experience, and want to bring it back home afterwards. And then there's the people that want to parlay that into an international career after the MBA as well. And I know for me also having the opportunity to work on language skills during the MBA, though admittedly you are very busy. So, you know, it is, it's a lot to pile on on top of the MBA. The chance for me to work on language skills so I didn't just have English was something that was also a fantastic bonus for me when looking at programs. And when you went to ESA, they actually had a section in the MBA program that was taught in Spanish. That's no longer true. Yes, yes. There, we still had one section um, when I, in my class, which was a class of 2010, we had one section in the first year that was bilingual, half English, half Spanish. These days, all of our, all of our first year is in English, and for those that are fluent enough in Spanish, there are some electives offered in Spanish, which is something I actually took advantage of in the end of my MBA. Um, if you're really looking to solidify your language skills being, being forced to do case studies in, a, in Spanish is definitely a way to, to push yourself. So, Deborah, if you and I went out to dinner tonight and we went to a Spanish restaurant, could you order in Spanish? I could, I could. I've been back in the U.S. now for almost 10 years, so I am rusty. But I can still uh, manage passport control in Spanish. I'm comfortable in LATAM. Um, I would not be the best conversationalist, but I can definitely work my way through a menu quite easily and give directions when I'm in Miami. So I've had the uh, privilege of visiting the campus in Barcelona twice <clears throat> this year alone. And I've got to say, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, top-notch. It's in, located in a great place. Um, you're on the hill overlooking the city. <clears throat> but what really differentiates the program, and this is something that's important for people to know, is 
uh, from the very early days of you got help from Harvard Business School to start up the program. Mm -hmm. So you were the first uh, MBA program in Europe to be a two-year MBA, mm -hmm. where it's very common in Europe to have one-year MBAs. Mm -hmm. You just introduced a 15-month option, so you can do it a little quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, the other really important distinctive feature of the program is its case study. And, um, and you know, everyone teaches by case study, but but usually case study is one of many ways that uh, learning is delivered uh, at Harvard and at ESA. Uh, that is the dominant method of delivery. <clears throat> and people who don't know much about this should know that case study teachers are the best teachers because it is extremely demanding to be good in a case study environment. And when you're only doing case study, those are the teachers who really know how to teach a case, not when you're, mm -hmm. you're among people who are doing the lecture thing or, or other modes of delivery uh, because that's standard and the standard is very high. If, if you had to identify other differentiating features, and I know uh, there are a number of others, what would they be? For the case study? No, nope, for your just, school oh, the and school. the MBA experience. Uh, yes, so I, I think that you know everything at YESA I think starts with the mission of the school and paraphrasing a bit, the mission of YESA is to support leaders who aspire to have a positive lasting impact and that's something that is, is sort of felt throughout the institution and especially within how we teach, it is something that is definitely reinforced regularly through how we teach the case study method. So when you are coming into the case study, when you're putting yourselves in the shoes of a manager, there's always going to be part of that conversation that has to be about what is the impact of this decision? What is it going to mean for your workforce? What is it going to mean from your community? So the decision goes beyond just the bottom number of that Excel sheet into the larger impact, which can actually open up other options and other ways of thinking that can be more holistic, that can can point you in directions that may be more beneficial long term if you're considering all of the factors. And I think there's a connection between that mission and how global the school is. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things you find when you leave uh, North America in particular is that different societies have a different view of what capitalism is. And, you know, I, I know some Europeans in the past have referred to American capitalism as jungle capitalism because we're so market focused and we want to win so bad. Mm -hmm. But in other parts of the world, there is uh, very much a greater concern for society, mm -hmm. for people, uh, and, and understanding that when you make a decision, it not only impacts you, but it impacts everyone around you. And it can impact your society, your environment, and you should be aware of those impacts and they should be part of the decision making. And that's really taught at ESA. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think another aspect of how we teach, which is a lot of how we teach is very team oriented. So I think it also helps to take advantage of the diversity within the class because you're pulling from each other, not just within the case study, but also while you're preparing for those cases. I know I spent a lot of time with my team in the first year with people from Morocco and Germany and Peru and India coming together and and bringing all of our perspectives together and you know supporting each other through you know a program that is very academically intense you know part of that of having this much case study is there's a lot of preparation that's involved um, to do it right so you know we ask a lot of our students but we ask it within a context of a very sort of supportive environment. So when people are struggling, when people are feeling overwhelmed, there's no ego associated with asking for help. And it is also a community that, that will line up to support each other as well. Is it harder to learn in an extremely diverse environment? I'm thinking just in terms of uh, the cultural disparities in communication mm -hmm. or even in value systems. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of the, you know, that first term is, is working on getting your team to function well because you come in with different ways of approaching business, um, different ways of communicating about things. And I think coming in as an American, it was particularly interesting because I think it changes how even native English speakers speak mm. because 
the emphasis becomes less about, you know, finding the jargon or finding the exact way to sound like the smartest person in the room and shifts much more towards being able to connect with your audience. Because, you know, if majority of the people in that, in that room speak English as a second language, you know, you showing your, your, uh, your ability to ma master the English language is not going to be the best way to manage situations. But it, it really is about focusing on connecting with people. And I think that that's very important. And, and it really is going to challenge you on a regular basis, especially with the case study environment, because you learn so much from the other people in that classroom. And people come in with so many different perspectives and different ways of understanding situations. So I know that you know, when I came in, I knew every single class that part of that conversation was going to go into directions that I had never even considered as part of the discussion or even, you know, something to even think about. And a lot of that has to do with that cultural element. And I think, you know, it's very important in that context to come in with a focus on, you know, curiosity mm -hmm. and an openness. So if you don't like, you know, being challenged. If you're very defensive, it's not the most comfortable environment. <laughs> but if you, if you really, you know, enjoy that situation where you're learning and seeing the world through different eyes, it really is a very good environment for helping you remove sort of the cultural blinders that you have to see situations in ways that, you know, other cultures might be approaching it. So when you head into those situations after the MBA and you're heading to a new part of the world that you've never interacted with, you come in and are better at breaking down to really see the basics where you may run into miscommunications because your understanding of the world's different. Sure. I mean, another attribute I think about your school is how dominant the entrepreneurial mindset is. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to business schools all over the world, and people do talk about entrepreneurship. But I, I sense that at your school, it's, mm -hmm. it's much more in the DNA. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I mean, I think it's something that a lot of people are, are interested in. And, you know, especially, you know, with Spanish culture, there's a lot of you know, family businesses and people running things that I think is part of, you know, the history of a program. Um, but I think it's definitely, you know, these days Barcelona is one of the hubs for entrepreneurship within Europe. So there's also a larger community around the school that people have been able to tap into. And I know right. they, that, you know, even since I've graduated, they've added a lot of support for entrepreneurship um, that's more formal through, you know, we have a summer program, the summer entrepreneurship experience for people that want to uh, work on ideas and get feedback on them and continue to develop them. Um, we have a entrepreneurship and innovation center that's actually technically been around for, for decades, but there's a physical space for it now that also sort of supports that with the space, not just for the student body, but also for the larger Barcelona startup community to come mm. and interact with the institution, the students, and each other so that the community's really brought onto campus as well. Right. Mm. Now, 85% of your students mm. come from outside Spain. Mm -hmm. So you limit the number of Spaniards in your full-time MBA program to 15 percent, is that right? Well, it's a bit of a limit, but we also want to keep the number sort of big enough because not only because we have such a we're such a strong part of the the DNA of the business environment in Spain, but also you know from the perspective of a student, it's very helpful to have locals to sort of help you to navigate oh, the absolutely. world around you. So our our Spanish students aren't just there for their education; they're also are sort of unofficial ambassadors to, to help the rest of the student body manage the, the culture and the world that they're, they're in like for that. the program. And I know you're entering classes like 350 to 370. Mm -hmm. You have five sections divided into 70 students each. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a cohort-based system. Mm -hmm. um, how many Americans go? Um, so it's going to vary a bit from, from year to year, but typically it's we'll have about... 10 to 15 percent of the class is going to be American. Well, that's a good percentage, actually. Yeah. 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 So you, you'll find your comrades yes. among the group. Yes. 
I think one of the things that I actually truly appreciate about the Americans that I see on campus is when I go back to catch up with them, to check in with the students that I send, send into the program, um, you know, the Americans that choose to do a program like Yes Aid are choosing to do it because they want an international experience. So while there is enough uh, there that they could all bond together, they have a tendency to actually never hang out with each other yeah. because they came for an international program. So the Americans on campus, they live with, they like share apartments with people from all over the world. Their closest friends are from all over the world. I know. Personally, for me, um, since graduating, I've been to Yesay weddings in Spain, um, uh, in in India, in Sri Lanka, in California. I missed weddings in Peru and Italy. Um, you know, it's wow. completely yeah. It it I think the downside is is for the weddings after the the MBA is it's a little bit hard to manage with a U.S. vacation schedule, but it is so worth it. So. Uh Inevitably, a question that people would have in going to Europe for your MBA is um, your career outcomes. Mm -hmm. how, how does that constrain the choices that you may want? Let's say you want to go to Barcelona and you want to do the two-year MBA program, but then you want to come back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, is it harder to do that and land the job with your MBA or not? So it's gonna, there's going to be a complication associated with going to a school that's on the other side of the world. You know, obviously there's not going to be the local presence. They're not going to have as close ties with companies in the U.S. And you know, just like our student body, our alumni base is is as you know internationally diverse. So um, they're going to be less concentrated in specific markets in the U.S. Um, that said, people that want to come back to the U.S., you can absolutely do it. I think it's just a matter of being prepared um, and ready to do the work that you need to do. Um, in a typical year, you know, we'll have Americans that end up in Europe, that end up in other parts of the globe, and a chunk that will end up coming back to the U.S. And some of that's going to be through on-campus recruiting, through companies mm -hmm. that do their global recruiting, um, you know, from in a in a central way, sure. Um, where they you know maybe do the first interview on campus and then send people off to the local offices, um, but for you know smaller companies or organizations that aren't doing recruiting within Europe, you're going to have to be prepared for uh, a career search that involves a lot of networking, and it can be done. It's just a matter of preparing, and I think our career services is very much focused on helping people with career development, so understanding the strategy behind it, because we're used to a student body that has a geographic element to how they look for their careers after right. the MBA, right. and it's not all going to be happening in Barcelona. So you know, there's a lot of focus on the skill set you need to connect with organizations that aren't coming on campus. And I will say that you have, in fact, uh, in career services, mm -hmm. An American who specializes in helping Americans go back and get jobs. Yes, yes. So Mike Mascarenas, who's sort of my counterpart in the in the Career Development Center, um, one of his purviews is is managing the North American career search. Um, so in whatever that means for for North Americans, whether it's you know coming back to the U.S. or trying to figure out how to structure their their search for other parts of the globe as well. Great. Now. And if you're in the U.S. and you're interested in the school, you've got to visit Deborah in her office. Her offices are opposite Carnegie Hall in New York City. Mm -hmm. Magnificent offices, great location. Uh, and, you know, I recently had the pleasure, as you know, uh, to sit as a fly on the wall in the admissions committee at uh, your school. And one of, the, one of the impressions I really got that was very strong for me is how important it is to make a connection. Uh, with one of the associate directors, or maybe several of them, uh, it really matters. And so I would urge anyone who's interested to go to New York. It's a great place to go. And use that as your launching plan to then visit Barcelona. But stop in and see Deborah, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I do travel all over the U.S. and Canada. Indeed. So there's plenty, there's opportunities to see me in other parts you of the world. You can have a coffee chat all over the place. Exactly, exactly. And we do understand it's not always possible for people to make the, the, the trip to Barcelona because it, it is far for a lot of our applicants. 
Um, but the fares are remarkably cheap on Norwegian and yeah. a few other airlines. I, Iberia as well. Yeah, I, I, if you have the ability to, I will never say that, that going to Barcelona is a bad idea. Besides, if they visit you in New York, can you fix them up with Carnegie Hall tickets? <laughs> Sadly, I don't think I have those connections. Uh, oh, well. Well, Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. Really a pleasure. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. Okay. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching. Thank you.